tell you what we'll do. Let's do verse 1 and 2. Alright, Brother Kevin, we ready? You ready? <laughs> Good morning, Greater Zion and friends. This is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We've come to worship our God in the beauty of holiness this morning. Today is a mighty good day to praise the Lord. Thank you, O Heavenly Father, for allowing us to come together and worship. Now, Lord, as the uh, pastor began to open up the bread of life, Lord, we ask that you would change the hearts and the mindset of the people that are before him, Father God. Touch their hearts that they are able to receive the word of God, Father God. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Everybody, come on. All right. It was early one morning. 
Just about the break of day Jesus came and he touched me And he washed my sins away I started running I started shouting I found no time for doubting And oh, I got nothing but the Holy Ghost About the break of day, Jesus came in my room and he touched me. He washed my sins away. I started running and shouting. I found no time to die. Oh, God got me from the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, well, the Holy Ghost saved me. The Holy the 
awesome God. He reigns. Sometimes we don't always understand how or why things happen the way they do. But as believers we have this blessed assurance this wonderful hope that all things work together for the good them who love the Lord those who are called according to his purpose whatever you may be facing be experiencing know that God has an uncanny way of working things out for our good in the midst of a pandemic in the midst of a crisis of leadership and there's brutality and murder and rioting and looting. When we're all excited about going back to space, yet we can't even share the space we have down here on earth with one another. These are indeed perilous times. And there's prejudice and hatred. It seems to abound and destruction all across our country. My hope is that we'll move past protest to some substantive change. My prayer is that people of goodwill will move forward there's going to be change. We're going to have to be the change we want to see. Let's go to God in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for another express privilege of your love. Thank you, O oh God, as we've come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. Pray now, O oh God, that as we have entered into the place we've gathered in the space, we've experienced already the presence of your Holy Spirit. O oh God, would you continue to move in our hearts, whether we be here or whether we be in our homes. Heavenly Father, help us to feel your Spirit and your power divine. Oh God, as we prepare to open the book, we ask that you would open our ears, our hearts, and our minds that we might hear, receive, and understand your word. Set David down and raise the Christ up within, and you preach with power, with conviction, with fire and authority. And all that you purpose your word to accomplish, we say thank you. We know your word will not return unto you void. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On this Sunday, May the 31st, 2020, Pentecost Sunday, we're still following the progression of our messages from the Passion to Pentecost. So I would that you would come with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. The 
Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, and for this morning's emphasis, I want to shine the sermonic spotlight on verse 1 and verse 2 of Acts chapter 2. And you'll find recorded these words. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Filled all the house where they were sitting. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you this morning in this message that will be a series message. I want to talk to you about Pentecost, power from heaven. Pentecost, power from heaven. Uh, amen. We are still practicing our social distancing and we're practicing our mask. Uh, I'm about 20 feet from you, so uh, I do have my mask. So I ask that you would practice that in the pews with us today. We're not going to move this world by criticism nor conformity to it but by the combustion within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. We are not going to move this world by criticism of it nor conformity to it, but by the combustion within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. That's a quote from Vance Harner. He made this statement, and I must admit that he was right. The early church had none of the things that we think are so essential uh, for success today. The early church did not have buildings and budgets and political influence and social status, yet the church uh, won multitudes to Christ and saw many churches established all throughout the Roman world. Why did that happen? It happened because the church had the power of the Holy Spirit energizing its ministry. It happened because the church had the power of the Holy Spirit energizing its work and its ministry. They were a people who were ignited by the Spirit of God. And the same Holy Spirit, and we've heard it sung this morning, the same Holy Spirit is available to us today uh, to make us more effective witnesses for Christ. The better we understand His working at Pentecost, the better we'll be able to relate to Him and experience his full power. The ministry of the Spirit is to glorify Christ in the life and the witness of the believer. John chapter 16 verses 13 through 14 says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show, or he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. This is Jesus talking. For he shall receive of mine, be received of mine, and shall show it unto you. And that's important. As we look at Acts chapter 2, uh, Acts chapter 2 will help us to understand the Holy Spirit by, and that's why I want to break this message up into a, a, a series, is Acts chapter 2 will help us to understand the Holy Spirit 
by re re recording for us four experiences in the life of the church and this early church. The first one we'll delve with this morning is the church waiting. The church was waiting. They were waiting on, uh, waiting for the Spirit. The second experience of this Acts 2 church was the church worshiping. And they were worshiping the Lord. The third is the church witnessing. And then fourth and final, the church walking. So we want to deal with this morning the church waiting. What, what, what were they waiting for? They, they, were, they were waiting. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the house where they were setting. Just prior to uh, Jesus' ascension, Jesus commanded his apostles or his disciples that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But to wait, he says in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Uh, much ink has been used in attempting to explain these five words, the promise of the Father. And there's various scriptures uh, uh, that make it clear that this promise of the Father, uh, what it was and, 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 what, and how it was referencing uh, the arrival of the Holy Spirit. If you're taking copious notes, and those of you who may be viewing, I want to look at a few of those scriptures that point us to the promise of the arrival of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28, Joel, the Old Testament book, Joel chapter 2, verse 28, it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And then look at me with Acts chapter in Acts chapter two, verses sixteen uh, through twenty-one. Acts chapter two, verse sixteen through twenty-one. It says, "But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel." And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaiding, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven, above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. And, and then, then, then the Son, Jesus, gives us the promise and the words of promise of this Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, verse 6. And he says, and I pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Then John chapter 14 verse 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And then John chapter 15 verse 26 says, But when the, we're talking about the Holy Ghost, but when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall, Jesus says, testify of me. 
And then finally, John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the promise will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Let me say this parenthetically as we look at Acts chapter 2 in reference to Joel's scripture uh, related to sons and, and daughters uh, prophesying. Look, 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 look back in, in, in Acts chapter 1 around verse 14 and, and you'll see that among the 120 who have gathered who represent uh, the early church uh, there were Acts chapter 1 verse 14 says there were the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brethren. Note, note, note Acts chapter 1 verse 14. I just, I just want to illuminate for you how Joel ties in to what's happening here prior to the Pentecostal experience in Acts chapter 2. So in Acts chapter 1, as they're waiting, as, as they're in quarantine there, as Jesus has told them to wait for the promise of the power of the Holy Ghost. Look, there's women there too. Joel says, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. The women were reference to the godly women who followed Jesus from Galilee. These women would include, among many others, Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, uh, Mary and Martha, uh, Mary, the mother of James the Less, Mary Magdalene was there, Salome was there, Susanna was there, Mary, the mother of Jesus was there. And really, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, this is the final mention of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the Bible. And then it also says not only were the women there, the disciples and the apostles there, the rest that make up the 120, but it says also his brethren, which referred to Jesus' half-brothers. He had two. He had half-brothers. Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, and Mark chapter 6, verse 3. And, and his half-brothers were unbelievers during Jesus' ministry. John chapter 7, verse 3 through 5 says that. But now, when we get to the waiting uh, group of believers in Acts chapter 1, waiting for the promise of the Holy Ghost, we see now that his brothers, his half-brothers, are believers. Two of these half-brothers who are there were thought to, be, uh, to have written the New Testament epistles of James and Jude, which bore their, which bore their name. So now when we get to Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit huh, is about to make his appearance into the life and the spirit of the believers. Now let me share this. The Holy Spirit uh, had of course already, uh, 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 thank you Sister Bender Nims, had already performed some Old Testament ministry. But, but now, when we get to Acts chapter 2, uh, his work was introduced to us uh, in three completely new elements. The Holy Spirit is being introduced to us in the New Testament in three completely new elements because uh, the Holy Spirit had been present we're going to bear that out in our argument this morning, had been present in the Old Testament. But look at what the Holy Spirit now, as it was coming uh, to this band of believers, to this group of the called out, to this early church, to the ecclesia, look at what the Holy Spirit was now bringing to them and inevitably bringing to us. The first, the first element that the Holy Spirit was bringing to these early disciples and apostles and to us was the fact that the Holy Spirit now was going to be universal. It was going to be universal. See, previously to this time, the Holy Spirit had confined His work among humanity and among particularly the nation of Israel. Uh, there was no record before the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit fell upon the Greeks or the Romans or the Babylonians or whoever. But now, 
He was coming to bless, listen to this, to bless every repenting sinner everywhere. The Holy Spirit was coming now to be universal. Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, and that whosoever included others that weren't part of the nation of Israel. So we thank God that now the Holy Spirit was introducing up to us this element that it was going to be universal. The Holy Ghost is available to all of those of us who receive Jesus Christ into our heart and repent of our sins. The second, the second, the second element that the Holy Spirit was bringing to this early church and bringing to us was it was to be permanent. It was to be permanent. The Holy Spirit has now taken up permanent residence in the lives of the believers of Jesus Christ. Although the Holy Spirit did come upon certain Old Testament men, He often departed from them also. And in Genesis chapter 6, Verse 3, you find that these words were recorded by Moses as given inspiration by God, which says, My spirit shall not always strive with men. An example of, of, of the Holy Spirit uh, coming and departing in the Old Testament, whereas now He's permanent with us. Let me give you a few examples. You ready? You ready? Let me give you some examples. Uh, uh, one example is Samson. You remember Samson? Samson. Strong man of the Bible, Samson, a judge in the Bible. This Hebrew strong man enjoyed uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit on various occasions. When you read Judges chapter 14, verse 6, and Judges chapter 14, verse 19, and Judges chapter 15, verse 14, and you find out that the presence of the Holy Spirit came upon Samson at various occasions. But then... Because of, check this out, because of sin and immorality, I'm going to tell you how, how Samson lost the privilege of having the power of the Holy Spirit. It's because of sin and immorality, God's Spirit left Samson. On, on one occasion, uh, in, in, in one of the most tragic verses in the Bible records this event when Samson awakes to hear Delilah say, The Philistines are upon thee, Samson. And the scripture says in Judges chapter 16, verse 20, that Samson woke up out of his sleep. And he said to himself, listen to what he said, he, he got cocky, he said to himself, I, 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 I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wist not, or literally he knew not, that the Lord was departed from him. Because of sin and immorality, Samson lost the power of the Holy Spirit. That's an example that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was not, was, not, was not permanent. And another example is illustrated by King Saul. Uh, as with Samson, the Holy Spirit came upon Saul, but it later left him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 14, it says, And the Spirit of God came upon him. But when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 10, I'm sorry, and that's in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10, it says, And the Spirit of God came upon him. But by the time we get to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 14, it says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God did not always strive with men. And then also, let me give you another illustration. I'm going to illustrate by, by the life of David. The Spirit of God came upon David when he was anointed by Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. And as far as it can be determined, this Spirit remained uh, with David until his death. But, but, but one thing about David is that David realized... That the Holy Spirit, Sister Kiera Mabel, the Holy Spirit could depart. And, and, and on at least one occasion, he pleads with the Lord about this matter. In Psalms 51 verse 11, he says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not, look at it, Psalms 51 verse 11, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. No Christian today, and I'm talking to you no Christian today need ever 
or should ever pray this prayer. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not your Holy Spirit away from me. However, millions of believers could probably, uh, with profit, pray the next phrase, Sister Marv of David's prayer of confession in Psalm 51 verse 12, when he says, Restore unto me the joy, Brother Walker, of my salvation. David offered this prayer after his great sin with Bathsheba. And then the third element, we said the Holy Spirit was going to be universal. We said the Holy Spirit now was going to be permanent. And the third is the Holy Spirit was going to be perfecting. It was going to be perfecting, Reverend Wiggins. This to say that the Spirit's new ministry would now be to make all repenting sinners grow in grace and be like Sister Wiggins' Jesus. This was not the case in the Old Testament. There, there's no indication that moral and spiritual nature of either Saul or Samson were advanced by the presence of the Holy Spirit. There, there's no indication that that. But now the Holy Spirit was going to help us to grow in grace and to be more like Jesus. See, Samson and Saul apparently derived only the power of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but not the purity. But now we've got the benefit of having not only, uh, Sister Simmons, the power of the Holy Spirit, but the purity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to bring to us the fruit of the Spirit where we began to start acting and operating and being more like Jesus. Now let's deal, let's deal, let's deal with today. We said today is Pentecost Sunday and many of my brethren across uh, the city and across this country are, are recognizing today uh, on the calendar as Pentecost. Let's talk about Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th. It means 50th because this feast was held 50 days after the feast of the first fruits. Now, if you want to know a little bit about the different feasts that were celebrated, the Old Testament feast celebrated by the Jews, you can go to Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 22. Uh, so Pentecost means 50th because it was a feast that was held 50 days after the feast of the first fruits. The calendar of Jewish feast in Leviticus 23 is outlined, really is an outline of the work of Jesus Christ. Because we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of scripture and prophecy. So, and the law and prophecy. So, so the Passover pictures his death as the Lamb of God. And we know in John chapter 1 verse 29 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7, we know that his death pictures him as the Lamb of God come to take away the sins of the world. And that's a reference to the Old Testament Passover, where the Lamb was, 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 was slaughtered and the blood was sprinkled over the doorpost as the death angel would pass through Egypt. And so, so Jesus represents, his death represents, uh, uh, is represented in Passover. And then the Feast of First Fruits picture is a picture of his resurrection from the dead. And we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Deacon Harper, verses 20 through 23. So 50 days after the first fruits is the Feast of Passover, which pictures the formation of the church. That Passover, I mean, uh, uh, Pentecost, uh, uh, pictures uh, the formation of the church. So at Pentecost, you hear me? At Pentecost, 50 days after the first fruits or the feast of the first fruit comes Pentecost. Jesus' death represents the first, the feast of the first fruit. For he gave himself a ransom. All right? So 50 days later is Pentecost. And at Pentecost, the Jews celebrated the giving of the law. But Christians celebrated because at Pentecost is the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. So the feast, the feast uh, of the first fruits took place on the day after the Sabbath following 
Passover, which means it was always on the first day of the week. The, the Sabbath is the seventh day or Saturday. And Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, and became the first fruits of them that sleep. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. Now, it, it, now if Pentecost was 50 days later, and if Pentecost uh, was, and, and you had seven weeks plus one day, then Pentecost took place on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. So in Acts chapter 2, it's Sunday, y'all, and it's Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. Christians were assembled and they worship today on Sunday, the first day of the week, because on that day, the Lord rose from the dead. And it was also the day in which the Holy Spirit was given to the church. Somebody say hallelujah. That's why we worship on Sunday. We worship on Sunday because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. And on Sunday was also the day that the Holy Spirit was given to the church. So we're celebrating Pentecost. I, Sunday I'm celebrating. I'm celebrating Christ's resurrection. I'm celebrating the Holy Spirit. So on the feast of the first fruits. When we look at. In the Levitical code, in, in, in the Feast of the First Fruits, the priest, check this out, Brother Walker, the Feast of the, of the First Fruit, the priest would wave in the Old Testament a, 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 a sheave of grain before, before the Lord. Sister Val, he would wave that uh, sheave of grain uh, before the Lord in the Feast of the First Fruits in the Old Testament. But, but on Pentecost, uh, the, the, the priest... Uh, presented two loaves of bread. And why did he do that? Because, because at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, check this out, Deacon Archie, the Holy Spirit baptized the believers and united them into one body. See, the Jewish believers received the baptism at Pentecost and the Gentile believers received the Holy Spirit at the house, when we get to Acts chapter 10, at the house of Cornelius. So this kind of explains for us why Deacon Harper, there are two loaves of bread. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 17 for that. And the fact is that in those loaves of bread, there was leaven, which is yeast. And yeast was a, a biblical reference to sin. In the loaves... Those two loaves that had yeast in them, it indicates the presence of sin in the church and in the earth. And let me tell you something. The church, contrary to popular belief, the church will not be perfected until it gets to heaven. And who are the church? I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the people. Every time you hear reference in the New Testament about the church, it's never about the building. It's always about the people. And let me tell you something. The church, the people of God, will not be perfect until we get to heaven. Hmm? We're still working it out down here, right? We're still striving and pressing toward the mark, right? And, and, and so, for those of you who said, well, look, I'm not going to church because there's too many hypocrites. Come on, let me tell you. We got room for one more because we're all down here trying to work out. Our soul salvation and, and the church is the best place. It's the hospital where sin sick souls can come. And the hope is that when the word of God meets up with the spirit of God, we'll be better to beat the challenges that come before the people of God. And listen, I'm not perfect. Huh? But I'm striving to be more like Christ Jesus. And every day the songwriter says, get sweeter than the day before. Every day I'm in the process of sanctification. It ought to be moving towards getting better and better. Ought not be the same old David I was a month ago, a year ago, ten years ago. I ought to be better today than I was back then. But guess what? I'm going to even be better on the next day and on the next year and the next month. And guess what? When I get to the point where God has perfected me, I'll meet him up in heaven. And until that time, sin will still be a part of the church. But we've got the power of the Holy Ghost to help us overcome the sin nature 
and help us to strive to be more like Christ. We must not conclude uh, by looking at Acts chapter 1, venturing into Acts chapter 2, that, that this 10-day prayer meeting brought about the miracles at Pentecost. We, we can't just say because they went a prayer meeting that that's what brought about the miracles. But let me tell you something. Uh, 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 we can pray today as they did. And, and, and some of us think that if we pray as the, as the early believers prayed, that we can experience another Pentecost. But let me tell you something. Just like our Lord's death at Calvary, Pentecost was a once and for all event that will not be repeated. The church may experience new feeling of the Holy Spirit. And certainly patient prayer is essential, an essential element to have some spiritual power. But we would not ask for another Pentecost any more than we'd ask for another Calvary. Jesus finished it all at Calvary. He completed the work of salvation at Calvary. And guess what? The Holy Spirit is now here and his work is completed because he's now working in the lives of the believers today. So we don't need to pray for another Pentecost. <laughs> we need to pray that God will continue to give us spiritual power, that our lives can be different, and that we can make a difference in the world. So, so, so now they've got the Holy Spirit. So they've got power with a purpose. <laughs> it makes no sense to have power and you don't have purpose with that power. You don't know what to do with that power. But the church had power with a purpose. At the beginning of Acts, Jesus' followers appeared confused and they appeared fearful. But by the end of the book, they were well on their way uh, to transforming uh, the Roman world with the gospel, which accounts really for the, uh, uh, what, 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 what really accounts for that dramatic change was what happens and what's said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It gives us the answer. Jesus says, and you shall receive power. Huh? Before they were, before the power of the Holy Ghost, they were fearful and they were confused. But now by the time we get through the end of Acts, we find out that they were able to transform the world. Why? Because they had power and that power was the Holy Ghost. Let me, let me share this with you. Let me, let me tell you some things about this power. Something that's worth, worth noting. The power that was promised was not force. Or political authority. Uh, that was not the power. Israel had enjoyed superiority under David, King David, and King Solomon, but those days were a distant memory. Jesus was not indicating a revival of Jewish dominance. Instead, the word power means the ability and the capability. Jesus promised that once the Holy Spirit came upon Sister Ireland, them, his followers would have a new ability. <laughs> Where they were fearful and confused, when they got the power of the Holy Spirit, they had ability and capability. They were able to do huh, some things that they were not naturally inclined to do. The ability also had more to do with being than doing. Right? The believers would be witnesses, the scripture says, not just do witnessing. And that's the key element for the church today, that we got to be, we got to learn that we need to be witnesses and not just do witnessing. Because you can do witnessing without being a witness. Huh? You, you've got to learn to be a witness. Huh? Because people, people will watch your life and they will hear louder, huh? How you live, as opposed to all the religious things that you do. Evangelism is a process. It ain't just an event. And some of us get out and we, we, we do evangelism, but evangelism is a process. We've got to live a life that shows the saving and the salvific work of Christ working itself out in us. Uh, it involves a total lifestyle, not just an occasional effort. Huh? You can't just say, I'm going to go do some evangelism next week. Evangelism has to be a part of your lifestyle. So everywhere you go, people ought to know huh, when they see you that there's Christ operating in you. And that they will have them to ask you the question, <laughs> huh? what is it <laughs> huh? that, that, that you have? Huh? 
and, and, and we sing that song every now and then. What is, what is it? Huh? What is this that makes me do right when I want to do wrong? What, what is this? Huh? Huh? Uh, what, what is this that won't let me hold my peace, right? Whatever it is, huh? And I know what it is. It's the Holy Ghost. Huh? And you got to let the Holy Ghost operate in you, huh? Because you and I can get in the way of the operation of the Holy Spirit in our life and we begin to act, act in ways and behave in ways that are not Christ-like. That's why the songwriter said, let the Holy Ghost lead you all the way. Not, not some of the way, not some of the time, but all the way. You've got to let the Holy Ghost lead you. So they had the ability through the power and that ability had to do more with being than doing. And then the last thing, this power came from without, not from within. It came from without, not from within. The believers were not to manufacture their own ways of proclaiming the gospel, but to look for supernatural ability from the Spirit to make them effective in gospel presentation. Hmm? They, 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 they were not to manufacture. See, no tricks, no schemes. Hmm? You don't have to conjure up the Spirit. Huh? You, 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 you need to look uh, uh, to God for supernatural ability from the Spirit to make the gospel presentation effective. Because if the Spirit don't come, huh, we just talking. Oh, but the Spirit has a way, huh, of transforming those words. To where they have power. This power came when the Holy Spirit arrived. They didn't have it before. It came when the Holy Spirit arrived. And then the last thing, these believers were to be witnesses to Christ. They would be witnesses to Christ. Not of themselves. Huh? They were to make disciples not to themselves. But they would make disciples unto the Lord. When Jesus gave them the great commission. Go ye therefore into all the world. Teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, and whatsoever I've commanded you, right? And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So they were to preach Christ. Let me share this as we close this part of this message. I remember hearing this powerful song in the church for many years. And it says, You must have that fire and Holy Ghost, that burning thing. That keeps the prayer wheel turning. That kind of religion that you cannot conceal. It makes you move. It makes you shout. It makes you cry when it's real. Huh? Keep your hand wrapped in the winding chain. My soul's been anchored in my Jesus name. I'm filled with in. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm free from sin. I know I've been born. Again, do you have that Holy Spirit? Do you know without a shadow of doubt that you've been born again? If not, you should be saying right where you are, Holy Spirit, I welcome you to come into my heart. Holy Spirit, I welcome you into this tabernacle, into this place. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I want the Spirit of the living God to fall fresh. On me, I need your spirit, God. I'm confused. I'm, I'm bewildered. I'm afraid. I, I'm impotent. I, I feel like I have no power. I feel like I have no ability. And God, I need your spirit to come in and occupy in me so that I can feel your power. So that my life can be a witness. My life can be a testimony. So that when I say some things, that there'll be meaning behind what I say. Because it's not my words, but it's the words of God that are able to transform and change life. I want to be a worthy vessel. I want to be used by God. I want His Spirit to rise up in me. So that I can be able to be bold in the proclamation of God. So I can be deliberate in my life and my walk for God. So that my testimony can make a difference in the life of somebody else. I thank God for the Spirit of God. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. 
I thank God that at the point of my salvation, at the point of my receiving Jesus Christ into my life, He gave me the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now lives inside of me. I, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. And my job and your job as you're watching me as believers, your job is to feed the Spirit that God has given you at the point and the day of your salvation. You've got to feed it the Word of God so you can have power. So that you can have power to proclaim the good news that Jesus saves. You can have power because you read the Word of God. You studied the Word of God. And second Second Timothy 2.15 says, study to show yourself approval unto God. A workman need not be ashamed. Rightly devise the word of truth. you got to have the word in you. So when times of adversity come, the Holy Spirit will bring the word back to your remembrance and you'll know what to do. You'll know what to say. You'll know how to be. I thank God for Pentecost. I thank God for the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know what my life would be if I didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit. I get weak sometimes. I fall short sometimes. I don't always make the right decisions. But I'm leaning and depending. And I'm trusting. And if the Holy Spirit that God has given me, that Holy Spirit will lead me and guide me. God bless you today. There might be one. Perhaps you're here. Perhaps you're watching. And you want to have that same kind of power. Power over your situation. Power over your circumstances. You're tired of being a victim you want to be the victor. You're tired of being the tail and you want to be the head. You've got to line up with God's word and God's will. And the Holy Spirit that Christ promised us will be our comforter. It'll be our guide. We can have power, that ability, and that capability to transform lives. Not only others, but our life can be a testimony and be transformed by that same power. As she sings, consider Christ and receive his spirit today. Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Breathe. 
me. of that news. For those of you who are watching us, thank you for participating in our worship this morning. We thank you for joining the Greater Zion Church and historic Greater Zion Church in Third Ward. If you'd like to Contribute to our ministry. Go to our website, www.greaterzionhouston.org. And on our website, there's a tab, a donate tab. You can donate to our church through our website. So make contributions through Giveify and the app Giveify. And also, we receive cash app. Greater uh, hashtag is the dollar sign. Hashtag Greater Zion Houston uh, is uh, the way you can give to our church. You can also mail your contributions to the Greater Zion Missionary Baptist Church, 3202 Truly Avenue in Houston, Texas, 77004. Listen, on next Sunday will be First Sunday. And for those of you who are watching us on First Sunday, uh, we have our drive-through Lord's Supper uh, 
from 11 o'clock to 11.45 to our members. Would you please come by? Meet us here. I'll be administering the Lord's Supper to you. I want you to wear your mask, keep your gloves on, and I will, I will personally distribute to you the Lord's Supper uh, in your vehicle. You can also get an opportunity to just wave and we can speak to one another. I miss you tremendously, and I look forward to those first Sunday opportunities where we can see you. For those of you who have been joining us on Tuesday nights for our Bible study, thank you. We do have our social distancing in place. We, will be, we are wearing masks and social distancing. And we try not to be in here any longer than an hour. So those of you who can join us on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock uh, for Bible study. If you can't join us personally, you can always catch us here on Facebook Live. Uh, we also upload it uh, to our website on uh, YouTube. I want you to be very prayerful for... Uh, our community, uh, we're uh, suffering in our community. Uh, one of uh, young men uh, in our community is a part of the Third Ward community, and, and George Floyd uh, was uh, killed, as you know, on Monday on Memorial Day. We continue to pray. There's great uh, concern and upheaval across the country in regards to uh, his death. Pray uh, for, uh, want to pray for justice, and want to pray for uh, wisdom, uh, and proper exercising of that wisdom to those who are demonstrating and those who are protesting. Uh, we don't want riots and, and looting. Uh, I hope they will work towards seeing change. Pray also for the Holman Street Baptist Church and our friends in Holman Street, Pastor Manson B. Johnson of the Holman Street Church and that church family. We continue to pray for all of our churches and all of our church families, all of those ministers and pastors who are leading normal uh, through uh, Facebook Live and through YouTube and other modes of social media. We thank God that the message is still going forth. Church is not closed. Uh, we're still open. And the word of God is going forth. Uh, we've just found uh, new ways to share the gospel and to reach those who are lost. God bless you. Let us prepare to conclude our worship.